What's going on, everybody? All right, we are coming to you with a semi-live again. Now, in the past, we've done a semi-live scope mounting. Now, we're going to continue on the process of essentially setting up your rifle. And if you hear a very slight drone in the background, hopefully not, but if you do, that's because we are in the indoor range right now uh, over here at Vortex. So we got 100 yards to work with, and we have Mr. Ryan Muggenhern, frequent guest, and we have Mark here as well. So uh, we're set up. We're going to go kind of through the essential, the, essentially the setup stuff you should have with you when you're at the range with your uh, firearm in order to have a, a good sight-in process. And really, there's a lot of rifles out there, and there's, there's many people who have sighted-in rifles. So we're not, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're not necessarily going to go over something that you haven't already done before necessarily, but we've got quite a bit of experience um, in our in our experience we found a number of things that could just make your sight in process maybe easier and also set you up better for maybe a more reliable more accurate uh just kind of situation in the long run and uh so we're just going to dive in right now if you haven't sighted in a rifle before this is a great thing to listen to as well because we're going to go through essentially everything you're going to need to do it and uh let's do this thing we're actually going to try some shooting too while podcasting so that's a first that sounds good. It's gonna be cool. No, I think I mean you touched on a couple things there, Jim. And if you haven't if you haven't sighted in a rifle or something, maybe you've had your buddy do that has a lot of gun experience or something like that. I mean, I, it definitely can be a little intimidating, right? Yep. I mean, mm. um, nobody wants to have an errant round go down range, or you know, I mean, and, and people when they want to go to the range or they want to go hunting, they want to have the utmost confidence that, you know, that, that bullet's going to impact exactly where they want it to impact. Right. And, and so, you know, a person might have, you know, five days of vacation that they're dedicating to this hunt, and if they get a chance at a buck or a bull or whatever, they don't want to miss, so maybe they have somebody else go through that process. But um, like you said, relatively simple, and, and we're not covering new ground, uh, but uh, definitely important yeah. ground. Yeah. A couple of teasers for you just to, to stick around for. So I think we're going to talk about gear that you need. We're going to talk about distance that we're, that we're zeroing at. So right now we're zeroing at 100 yards, but there is some conversations out there. 50 yards, 200 yards, 300 yards. What distance to zero at? We're also going to talk about boar sighting. We're going to talk about shooting your proper groups um, and uh, some of that stuff. So stay tuned here. Uh, and One thing I wanted to ask Ryan here real fast is that on Instagram we have... Uh, where is he at here? I am Steve uh, Costa. Oh, Steven. He wants to know how far you intend to shoot that 30, 40 Craig, Ryan. Uh, great question. Shout out to Steven. Uh, when the Craig is done, if the sights that I want to put on there work, I, I'm going to say that comfortably this is going to be a 400 yard hunting rifle. All right. Yeah. Rock on, man. Yeah. I believe that it'll shoot much farther than that, but the level of, of uh, ethics and, and morals come into play uh, when we're shooting an open sight firearm. Good deal. Yeah. And uh, for those of you, too, who like watching stuff on YouTube, we're going to have this video recorded. we got uh, MC Ryan's got to set up on video as well. So let's dive right on in. So first off, first things first, Ryan, what do you do first? Okay, so let's explain the gear that we have here. Cool. We've got our rifle. We've got a scope mounted up. I mean, what else? what else is going on that's important to have with you at the range when you're so when I when I do this for myself, when I when I zero my my rifle, I'm going to back up and I'm going to let folks listening that haven't zeroed their rifles before or are, are daunting it or getting into this. It used to be like a dreaded process. I always thought like you got to buy like six boxes of ammo and then go out and do all this, and, and and it's not. It's not something to fear if you've got the right equipment, the right environment, the right tools. It's very very easy. Um, so sitting on on the shooting bench for those of you not watching this video. We've got a sturdy bench. Um, we've got a Caldwell um, front rest. This is a, they call it, I believe the dead shot is, is I believe the product name. I, I run these uh, a lot personally. We've got a whole bunch of them here at Vortex. It's a simple um, and sturdy front rest. And then at the rear of the rifle, we have a simple V style or, or notch style sandbag that just supports the rear of it. One thing I do want to point out is, is when sighting in rifles for best performance and for for you know the longevity of your rifle and your optic and and your accessories do not put 
your rifle in one of those devices that contains the rifle completely. You put sandbags on it or lead shot bags, and it holds and, and it secures your rifle. You need to let your rifle recoil. Um, otherwise, you can break your action screws, uh, your stock, your scope. You, you don't, you don't want to do that. So we want to have... It's pretty jarring, you know, when... If you can imagine, that is essentially kind of the circumstance of when uh, an unstoppable object meets an immovable force, or yeah. I think it's the other way around, or whatever. Gosh, dang it, that phrase always confuses me. But it's it's kind of you know, in order for the rifle, it has a very it has a very exact shock wave yep. that it's supposed to go through, and and sort of actually, if you watch a rifle in slow motion, which we'd encourage some of you to do sometimes, it's pretty cool. You'll see the barrel actually whips. You'll see uh, the shock wave kind of move back and then into the shooter, and actually, you become part of the rifle when you're holding it. And so, if you have it in some kind of a locked down weighted vice of sorts, um, all that shock it needs somewhere to go, and the weakest link in your rifle whatever that might be, whether it's fasteners, whether it's who knows what, it will be exposed because all that shock is going to find its way into somewhere. And it, it's either got to break something or it's got to wind up, you know, yeah. shaking something loose or yeah. whatever. You know, another point with that, Jim, also is you're kind of cheating yourself out of, you know, that connection to the rifle when you're using that full containment system. Yes. You're not, you know, that, that uh, the stock isn't seated you know, where it should be on your shoulder. Your cheek weld is going to be different. Um, and you're also, I guess, in an effort to, I guess, achieve, you know, optimum accuracy or, or that perfect zero. But um, you're losing, you're, you're cheating yourself out of becoming familiar with that rifle yep. and how it recoils and how you react to it yep. um, or, or even just get used to it and learning how to manage it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. Part of me has always wondered, too, like, you know, when somebody takes a gun out, um, you know, they talk about, Maybe they got scope-eyed, you know. There's a number of different reasons that that can happen, but, you know, I do wonder at times it'd probably be easy to happen if you have used your rifle or sighted it in in one of those vices, and then all of a sudden you take it out and you just don't know what to expect. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd ask you this, Ryan, too. Because maybe you aren't getting that, uh, you know, that rifle seated where you'd, you'd normally mount it and that cheek weld, you know, and you've gotten this zero using that type of system, it... I, is there any risk that actually when you... Your zero isn't your zero? Your zero isn't your zero. I yeah. think in theory, yes. I, and I, I would equate this back to archery kind of too. So like you could have a bow that's, quote, sighted in, right? But the other component to this is the archer, him or herself, right? So if you and I had the same draw length, mm -hmm. 29 and a half, and I clipped onto your bow and you clipped onto my bow the high likelihood is because of the way we hold the bow differently, because of the way that, where, you know, where we put our anchor points and all these things. When you shoot my bow, you'll miss, and when I shoot your bow, I'll probably get string slap and, and the arrow will fall off the rest and everything else will go awry. Uh, that happens when I shoot my bow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah. Just, to, just kidding, actually. I love my bow. <laughs> to, to your question, I think so, yeah. I think, um, I think a lot of folks... Uh, Yes, I think you're 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 running the risk of not having the right zero for your gun because you are part of that system. Per what Jim said earlier, is yeah. is when you when you grab onto that thing and begin shooting it, you become part of the system that is the barrel, the trigger, the scope, the stock, the shooter, the the whole yeah. thing. So now one other thing too, um, speaking to just shock waves and things that the rifle undergoes. So we talked about this before we started casting, Ryan. So we've got it in this, I forget what you call it. It was the front rest yep. um, and then a rear rest. And both these things have sandbags. And there's a, yes, Mark is raising his I just, hand. I just wanted to bring up one, one point about the front rest is it is adjustable height. So yeah. you could almost, it almost has like a, you could call it a micro adjust for the end of your rifle, you know, raising it up and down, mm -hmm. which again, yeah. for each shooter, like if I was to go sit up there where Ryan has it mounted, I might move that up and down. Yep. So, and That's it's, true. it's just a really handy feature to have. It is. So, but one thing is, so these have, these have essentially sandbags that the rifle is resting in. And it's good to have that soft surface for your rifle to be resting in. Whether you're shooting, if you have like, you know, let's say some people zero in and they just lay down prone at the range. If you're in grass or like a softer kind of terrain like that, then you should be good. But sometimes people shoot off concrete pads 
or they'll shoot off in this case, we just have a hardwood table or sometimes they're hard concrete uh, platforms that you sit at at the range. And we have a bipod on this gun, so we could just as easily flip that bipod down and then use the rear sandbag that we have. But there is a thing called bipod bounce. And Ryan you, or Mark, maybe either of you guys might be able to explain that better than I can. But that, that, can, that can kind of wind up uh, essentially creating larger groups than you would you would ordinarily expect or yeah. want and and it's just it's mostly because again when you have that shot going through and it's transmitting into just another hard object harmonics and follow through mm -hmm. yeah uh it's a real thing no jim jim's absolutely right it, it can be you can mitigate it um you can learn to shoot it uh and shoot it well um but I find myself I do shoot best off of of bags, and I, I guess I haven't really tested the the theory enough to be like, well, okay, is this something actually mechanically happening with um, the gun and the way it vibrates and and the way that uh, everything reverberates, or is it my inability to maintain control through the follow through sequence when firing the mm -hmm. rifle? And I actually think it's a little bit of both if I'm going to look at it. But I I do shoot better off of the bags. Um, you know, they, they, that soft surface, like you said, uh, helps a lot. And, and, and for those who are watching this, you'll see there's no containment on the rifle. It's pretty much just cradled on the bag. Um, so I, I let the bags do the work of holding the gun up, and then I manage the free recoil. But that, that soft surface kind of cushioning that blow, so to speak, or absorbing that, that harmonic impulse um, seems to help me shoot better groups. Mm -hmm. Free recoil. Some might call that free reezy. Free reason, <laughs> you know, anyway. but I feel I feel like we've seen that when we've you know watched guys who are really accomplished long range shooters yeah. and they're shooting off their bipod on a cement pad, which is a very you know obviously rigid yep thing to shoot off, and they're getting frustrated and you know they're wondering why you know their impacts aren't going where uh, they were maybe when they're sighted in their rifle or shooting and and trying to make adjustments, and then I feel like I've watched guys just move their bipod off the cement pad onto just even dirt. Yeah, yeah dirt. And it really begins yeah. to uh, mitigate that. It does, or even just put it on a pack. Yep. Slide yep. their pack in. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, all right. So now we've kind of talked a little bit about some of the equipment here. The other thing that we have is, so I'm standing behind Ryan on spotting scope. And I, at 100 yards, Ryan right now has the HSLR 6 to 24. So he's got a 24 power scope. He's, he may very well be able to see his impacts down there on the paper. We're just shooting paper targets. That's another thing. It's nice to be able to shoot on paper targets rather than steel, yeah. especially because when you have a painted steel target and that bullet hits or that it, it impacts, it creates a lot of splash. And it's, it's just not as easy as just holes in paper to tell exactly how much you need to correct. But I'm on a spotting scope here. I can really you know, hone in and kind of see, uh, where he's impacting, help him out. Uh, so again, maybe part of your equipment is just bringing along a buddy if you've got one, but if not a spotting scope helps out or just, uh, some higher power optic. Um, it can certainly alleviate some walking and time. It can, it can. And so we've got that. Um, now what else do we have? I was trying to remember if there's anything else before we get started. <sighs> The ammo itself, we know the sh ammo shoots good out of this gun. Mark, what were you about to say? I was going to say, well, you were talking about the targets, and I've heard um, you, Ryan, and I believe a few other guys talk about uh, target color, or yep. it seems like um, people will at times want to use like an orange dot because it's a very high vis thing, uh, you know, provides like a, a very easy to see aiming point. But I've also, I've, I've heard. I guess mixed reviews on mm. if that actually is the best choice, and maybe speak to that a little bit. For me, it's not. For me, I prefer white, black, black, white. That's it. Um, the bright colored dots, like orange or blue or green or chartreuse or whatever color that you're looking for, while really good for catching big water bass or big mouth bass, uh, yeah. they don't do good for me when I'm looking at a target. It actually it makes it look like the target or the aiming reference is is moving on me. That's what I've heard. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I feel like I've seen that yeah. as well. And mm. I, I actually see the phenomenon uh, s similar when I'm shooting open centered reticles. Um, I have a hard time doing that. And friends of mine love them. They bracket and they shoot, they shoot tight little groups, but like something in my head prevents me from doing that. And I don't know if it's resultant of an astigmatism or, or if there's something more to this that I'm missing, but brightly colored targets and open centered reticles are, are tricky for me personally to shoot. Um, mm. Yeah. 
The uh, the black and white though, it's very bold. It's very stark, and with good lighting, there's I don't think there's anything more visible than that contrast. Pretty that, easy. Yeah, in all it, conditions. Yeah, and so there's no fringing. I'm not I'm not like is that the edge of the target or is that the you know that the you know the the void beyond it. Uh, it's black and it's white, and that that hard line there is is very very important for you when I'm shooting for for groups and accuracy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, good, good question. So let's dive in on this. Yeah. Now, one other thing I did forget to mention, this is what I knew I was forgetting something, but it's not a bad idea to bring some of your scope mounting hardware. So yeah. like a torque wrench with the proper bits for your rings and mounts out to the range with you because as you actually get shooting, now in our semi-live scope mounting video, we talked about getting the proper eye relief, getting the proper, you know, just set up for your scope so that it's comfortable and you can see well behind the optic on maximum power because then you know you're going to be good on lower powers. But as you actually get shooting, that you may find that you're slightly off or you, you may find that, you know, for whatever reason you thought you were level, but you're not quite level or, or whatever it is. So you, you want to, it's not a bad idea to just bring that along just in case. Yeah. So, but Ryan's got this, uh, it's Tika yep. all kind of just, uh, rested up here. And this Tika in this case has a cheek rest, like an adjustable, uh, cheek riser mm -hmm. in, embedded in the stock or integrated into the stock. And so he's got that removed because what we're going to do first is bore sight. And uh, so bore sighting essentially consists of removing the bolt. In the case of a bolt gun, like we have here, just traditional style bolt gun, we're removing the bolt. Um, on, I've done it before with bore sights. I've just re removed an AR upper from the lower, for example. Take out the bolt carrier group, take out the charging handle. Um, and then you can see just from the back of that upper receiver down the barrel. Uh, it really helps out. And then you can bore sight. The, I'll essentially just rest the upper in, again, sandbags like this, and then you're able to just glance up and down uh, between the scope and the rifle, which we'll get into that process here. But essentially what we're saying is it doesn't have to be a bolt-action rifle to do this properly. A lot of rifles have some means of taking the, the bolt or, or parts of the action out that you can see from the back of the rifle or the back of the receiver down the barrel, and that's kind of what we really want to do here. Yeah. So... Why don't you dive in on this on this process here? Because you cool. remove the bolt. So yeah, one one more note on bore sighting. It's a term that gets thrown around a lot. And when we're doing this method, and if you get to, a chance to watch a video and, and see what we mean by bore sighting, it will make a lot of sense. I am physically looking down the barrel right now, like through the the bore. I see the rifling, the lands, and the grooves. And what I'm doing is I'm centering the target in the middle of the bore to the best of my ability. Um, so right now I've got it looking at one of our, our large, uh, black targets downrange. It's centered in my bore and then I'm referencing my scope. Um, as you get familiarity with a particular rifle, you'll find that its alignments are pretty consistent. Um, I shoot this, this rifle a lot. I, I shoot it several times a week. Uh, and, and its alignments are, are really well known to me. And so when looking at it now, I'm not surprised to see where my bore sight lands with my scope in its mechanical center. So if your scope is, if you're taking it off of one gun and putting it on another, you may not find that it's in a predictable spot. But um, knowing that this optic was centered and, and putting it on this gun, uh, I'm glad to see that it's exactly where I'm used, you know, used to it being. And, and on bore sighting too, there's a, a number of different devices available for you if you have one of those guns, like let's say a Marlin 336 or a Winchester 94 or a Browning BLR, that you cannot remove the bolt to peer down the barrel very easily. Or what about an AK? Uh, or an AK? Could you do an AK? No, an AK wouldn't work that well. Um, yeah, anything like that, you can get an Arbor type or a cartridge type insert that goes either in the end of the barrel or in the chamber itself that projects a visible laser downrange. Um, they work. I found that they're not as reliable as doing this method for a number of different reasons, um, but they do work well. And so I, I, I encourage you, if, if you've got a gun like that, if you've got a firearm like that, utilize one of those devices so that you're not expending a ton of ammunition just trying to find yourself. Start at a closer distance to like 25 or 50 yards. Yeah, I was just going to say, so let's say somebody's literally at the range and they listen to this now and they've got an AK or they've got one yep. of those kinds of rifles and they're like, uh, well... You know, rather than going home and just saying, I'm going to have to, you know, hang up the shoes for this day or whatever, yep. uh, you can still do it in what Ryan just alluded to at the very end there. Start at 25 
And if you're ultimately zeroing at 100, which we will have to get into that, by the way, zero distances. But if you're ultimately zeroing at 100, start at 25, because essentially we're dealing with we're dealing with angles. We've mentioned that a couple times before. And angles, you could have a 30 degree angle from your rifle, and that's going to take up less space closer to the rifle than it does way down range, right? Yep. And so you're much less likely to be, if your gun and scope happen to be way off when you mount up the scope, you're much less likely to have your rounds go off target to the point where it's just really hard to understand what you need to adjust. And you're much more likely to at least get rounds on target, and then you can adjust to kind of a, a loose zero there, bring it out to 50, and then it will change slightly, but you can at least know that once you finally kind of inch yourself out to 100 yards, you're not going to be shooting just zinging them away off target, and you'll at least be able to have them on paper so you can make proper adjustments. So, Yeah. Continuing on, I'm going to make my first adjustment into the rifle scope. And again, this is just during the bore setting process yet. So I've, again, centered the target in my uh, bore. Uh, I'm going to double check that here because I touched the gun. And without putting any influence on the rifle, so we want to keep it as still as possible, uh, looking through the barrel, or, you know, centering that target up, and then looking through the optic and adjusting the optic until the reticle moves to a point in which we want to call it bore sighted. Now, it's been my experience, and, and I think a lot of different rifles or, or shotguns or, or weapon systems may be different, but at 100 yards, I found that when I bore sight, it's actually advantageous for me to have, of course, the windage lined up on the, uh, the optic, but to have the elevation actually below my target. And looking down range here, uh, I'm going to use my reticle to measure this real like quick. significantly below or yeah. just a little bit? Yep. So I, I found it, it's best. I'm currently four minutes of angle beneath my target, so about four inches below the center point on mm -hmm. that. And I, I think I'm going to end up making an adjustment further when, when we do fire this thing. But that seems to have been the trend over the you know the past you know dozens and dozens of rifle scopes that I've shot is being actually below the intended target seems to work better. So um, I'm going to call this bore sighted. I'll, I'll, I'll double check it again. So I'll just set up the again. Now what? Okay, here's one thing that we get a lot. Back when I was on social media a ton and helping people out, people would message in and they'd ask, hey, my turrets are backwards. Oh, and yeah, this is the question. This oh. is probably the only time that I can think of, the only time when you actually want the reticle to move... Like if you want the reticle to move to the right, you would you would think that you would move the turret in the direction where the arrow is pointed to the right. Right. And but you're actually doing it the opposite. And this is the only time that it's it's the opposite because you are physically moving the reticle. So essentially if you want the reticle to physically move to the right to match up with your barrel, you actually want to spin it in the in the left direction, the windage turret in the left direction which seems all crazy weird, but that's ultimately going to make it so that when you're actually shooting and you're actually impacting rounds on paper or on steel, let's say then that impact was to the left and you wanted to move it to the right or the other way around, you, you would actually move, you're moving the actual impact downrange Correct. with the, the turret. The, the way I best describe it is remembering that the rifle scope actually is not connected to the bullet or anything like that. It can't drive it. The way that we do this is we force our muzzle. So if we land left, what do we have to do with our muzzle to move that impact right? We have to force the muzzle right, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we have to move the scope left so that we then bring it over further. Um, to the, the intended point of impact mm -hmm. um, or point of aim. And I'd, I'd say, you know, if you do get a little bit confused with that during just that bore sighting process, I mean, one thing to remember is you are just making the center crosshair move to the object yeah. or target that you're looking at yeah. through the... You're just ma nothing, you're matching the two things up. There, there's nothing riding on this. So if you accidentally no. move it the wrong way at first, you can always move it back. It's right. not like you're going to take a crucial shot. That's true, too. You know, so... And, and going back to the tools that we have here during that bore sight process, having a stable platform with the bags because yep. you're not necessarily... You don't necessarily have the, the optic mounted, so you kind of need the ability to, you know, look through the rival scope, look through the bore, and then match the two up. Yeah. Sweet. 
All right, so you've got it. You said you think you're more excited now. We're there, which basically means we're we're close. We we are unlikely, unless Ryan is a master boar cider, to be dead on. But at least this is going to get us close. So we have less shooting, uh, less utilization of ammo just for the process of zeroing in to do, hopefully. Yeah. And uh, at this point, then we just load her up, right? Yep. So I'm going to put my bolt back in, uh, and then I'm going to put my cheek piece back on. And um, so not every gun has a removable cheek piece. Uh, this one does, which is really handy. Um, and so I'm going to set that up here really quick for my height so that I'm looking through the scope as square as possible when I've got uh, my weight down on it. Um, and again, I don't want to be overbearing on the rifle. I just want the rifle to be supported. I want it to be able to recoil without issue, um, but I don't want to have to hold it up. I don't want to use muscle structure to hold or manipulate the firearm. I'm using the, the bags to hold it up. So at this point, I'm going to say I am ready to go. If you gentlemen are ready to go, everybody's got... Eyes and ears. All set. We are going to commence firing. A um, couple other things here. Uh, check your parallax. If you've got an adjustable parallax scope, uh, I've done that here, so we're good to go. We want to give our, up at 100. Yep. We want to give ourselves the highest potential for accuracy. So let's give this a swing. All right. I'm going to fire at the lower right target uh, down there. So you let me know when you're ready, spotter. I'm watching. And I will send it shortly. All righty. So now you're going to shoot two more, right? So off the bat, you shot one shot here. Yep. And I can tell you right now, just for reference, that you're high right. Yep. But we're not going to make an adjustment immediately off that because we first want to check. Now, you know this rifle freaking shoots lights out. Mm -hmm. We first want to check to make sure that we tightened our rings properly, that everything else is working properly, and that this is an accurate shooting rifle. Um. You know, the, the worst thing we want to do or the worst thing we could do is just immediately start adjusting this based on one shot and then find out later on that we accidentally forgot to tighten down the rings properly or something weird is going on with we have a suppressor on this rifle and maybe it's not tightened down properly. And it's causing some strange issues, you know, and all of a sudden we thought we were going to move our just, you know, impact down into the left pretty simply. But then it zings off in another direction. And then we go, okay, and then we try and make a correction based off that. And we're chasing our rounds all over the target. Yeah. When really, if we would have just shot a three-round group, we would know right off the bat, hey, this isn't shooting a really good group. Something's got to yep. be going on here. Right yeah, here. or I mean, you could have simply just pulled, pulled the first shot. Oh, totally. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And that could be something as simple as that, too. Let's commence. All right. So now, round two. The reason I brought up the you know potential of uh, mount issues because I mounted the scope, so I wanted to kind of <laughs> I wanted to kind of like give myself a little buffer there just in case you know. A couple caveats there. Yeah, caveats, but so far so good. Uh, that's looking to be a uh, decently tight group there. I am terrible at estimating linear distances downrange. All right. So you are high into the right. And I mean, I on your scope, can you see that pretty well enough to use your sub tensions yeah. on the on the yeah. reticle to know what to dial? You bet. Okay. So one one thing Jim just mentioned sub tension. So a lot of reticles. Um, I'm using a Viper HSLR right now, the six to twenty four variant, which has our XLR reticle, um, and it has a ton of usable information in it. Uh, namely the, the reticle scale here, or the subtensions, as Jim had mentioned. And they are lines that, that mean something. They uh, correlate with a particular distance in minutes of angle um, between each other. So on the XLR reticle, um, I've got a subtension line every one MOA. So I can look at this, and I can say that I need to adjust my scope based on where my, my mean group is here, the median group at about two and a half MOA to the left. And I'm gonna get a measurement on the, on the uh, elevation axis here. And I'm going to say we wanna go about one and three quarter MOA down. So we're gonna move two and a half left. And trust your turrets at this point in time. So what we were talking about earlier with, with reticles moving backwards, if you look through your scope and, and I make this adjustment, if I'm rotating that scope the left direction, my, my crosshairs are going to move right. And that's normal. That's what's supposed to happen. 
keep in mind, if we move the reticle to that point that we hit, we then have to force our muzzle the opposite direction to, to make that work. So I'm going to adjust, like I said, that. I'm going to go two and a half. Is that what I said, two and a half? Sounds Something right. like that. Yep. And then we're going to go down. We're going to go down one and a half because the HSLR actually has a half uh, MOA turret <clears throat> adjustment per click on the elevation. Uh, so we'll go down three clicks or one and a half MOA. Which is interesting because going back to what you were talking about before, when you got that bore sight, you were actually below mm -hmm. the intended target impact, Correct. and you still had to move it a oh, little yeah. bit down. That's right. Yep. Correct. Huh. And when, it's funny, actually, now that you mention it, because I can think of darn near every time I've bore sighted a rifle. Right. I'm way high. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah. Interesting. Huh. So let's give this. So we're going to bring in another, th uh, another three round group. So we finished that one up. We've got a group down range. I honestly couldn't tell you how big or small of a group that is because I'm, again, like I said, terrible at estimating these things. But it's a pretty, it's a pretty decent group. And I'm going to. Do you, I mean, what would you say that is, Ryan? Um, is it like MOA? I'm going to say in terms. What would you say that is about? Wait, uh, Eighty feet. Yeah, it's about. Sure. It's about a one MOA group. All right. All right. And right, so we are going to go ahead and we are going to fire here on the center. I bet you can. I bet you can squeeze a better group out of that. I right? bet I can too. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give you some. I was. Some I crap was here on the podcast. I was in front of everybody. I, I was just goofing with the first one. <laughs> Two rounds. Now a third. Pew! All right. So, I'm going to check through this spotter. There, now, that's the kind of group I'd expect out of you, Ryan. There's a little mirage coming off of my barrel, and this is something, too, I want to uh, point out. Usually when we shoot, uh, we do our range certification or product testing down here, we have a large and powerful fan that we blow perpendicular to the barrel. Uh, and it, it does a couple of things. One, it helps strip heat off the barrel. I can shoot... Um, strings longer i can i can usually get about 20 to 24 rounds before my rifle starts to exhibit any kind of thermal influence and and i've got to take a break and let it cool down uh this the i think kind of more importantly though it pulls the mirage off the top of my barrel um and so your suppressor and my suppressor yeah that's a, that suppressor that we have on there right now contains a ton of heat um long after the barrel cools Interestingly enough, those suppressors are still warm to the touch. Um, so it's, it's always awesome to me when I'm, I'm breaking down for the evening and, and um, I'm putting everything away and I go back into the armory and I go set the rifle in there uh, and I grab it and I put it in the safe and the suppressor's still warm to the touch and I haven't fired around in 45 minutes. Um, I, it's just something very special. Little hand warmers. Yeah. That, yeah. They're really nice when it's cold on the range. Yeah. And <laughs> it, it, yeah. Well, I know we've had calls from folks who are like, Hey, I shoot five rounds, and, and my scope goes blurry. Exactly. But then when I when I let the rifle set, it goes back to clear, and that's what they're experiencing. That that Ex mirage exactly is coming correct. off the barrel or the suppressor yep. or whatever, and it's kind of you know degrading their image quality. But it's just it's an external factor. Hundred percent. Yeah. And a lot of times they call and they say, "Is there a loose lens that I'm knocking loose every you know couple of rounds?" Okay, right. But really, it's just that mirage. Mm -hmm. And uh, so so the best I can describe mirage. Um, if you've never experienced it, is when you're looking through the scope as I am now, and, and this is most prevalent at higher magnifications because we are amplifying that mirage's prevalence. I said prevalence twice. Um, three times now. That's a good word. Uh, when you look at it, it looks like you're looking through water. Um, like it's, it's, uh, it's very wavy and milky and, and very distorted. And you are technically looking through water. You're looking through water vapor. Um, heated up uh, in the air around you or around the barrel or the suppressor in this case. Um, and so it is very difficult to look through and, and a lot of experienced shooters can um, kind of fight through it and get used to it, uh, but, but it will open up your group if you're not accustomed to shooting through Mirage. So understand that as you continue to shoot and your barrel heats up, it will probably get harder for you to hold a good group. Um, so if you, if you want to take, you know, some time in between the shots and, and keep your barrel from getting exceptionally warm on the outside, that should help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it almost seems like the reticle jumps around a little it, bit. It does. It you will know, visually. Give, yeah. It will give you the appearance of, of your reticle moving. And 
and we've we've conducted a test here at Vortex Optics. Um, our friend Scott Parks, who's been on the podcast before, did this. It is moving. It, not like downrange isn't moving, right? But right, opti- and in the scope, it's not moving. Yeah, optically, it's moving, and it will cause you to hit a different place because where you think you're aiming, you're in fact not. A lot of those like uh, F class dudes. Now they they have. Man, dude's in F class. Actually, we got to do a podcast on that at some point with Ian Clem oh, here, yeah. who uses the Golden Eagle, and actually he's a two-time national champ and world something champ, or another. Yeah, yeah world yep. champ actually. Sorry, um, very accomplished. Yeah, I mean, but you know, he's got. Uh, you look at those guys' rifles, and they've got these crazy apparatuses over the entire length of the barrel to hopefully to try and mitigate mirage, mirage which is funny too because those guys actually at times utilize mirage to their advantage. Yes, because right. Because mirage happens downrange. So if you've ever been driving. Let's say you're in some really hot area, middle of the summer, you've been driving along and you look ahead and you're on a really long straight road and sometimes the road just looks like it disappears. It just goes into the sky. Yep. Well, actually, you're seeing essentially a reflection of the sky in this mirage. Now, I'm by no means a mirage expert, a mirage entist, uh, but <laughs> that it can happen far down off of your gun as well. And so sometimes what they'll do in those really... Uh, really intense kind of long-range competitions like F-Class, they will actually use Mirage and see how it's blowing yes. downrange to understand to what the wind, wind is like downrange. To, to put an F-Class shooter into perspective, for those of you who don't know them, um, they're way smarter than I am, and they can see air and know what is happening. I don't understand it. They it's, can see wind good. Yeah, they can see wind. Uh, so those guys really know how to shoot quite well. Yeah. So what do you think here, Ryan? Now you're shooting. Uh, that was that was the the group I would have expected out of this rifle, and out of you. That's sub MOA right there for yeah. sure. So, um, but we're down a little bit, mm-hmm. and I'm curious on your thoughts too. So in this case, you are very slightly, very slightly to the right. Correct. So I am going to give a one quarter minute adjustment to the left, uh, just one click, uh, and and that that will satiate me on that. Now I measured the group using the reticle. Um, the group uh, relative to the the point of aim here, the the bullseye, if you will. Um, And we're just between one half and one minute of angle low. So we're we're about 0.6 or 0.7, 0.75 minutes of angle low. Now, something to point out on this particular scope, again, the the, um, adjustment that we have here, the the most finite adjustment I can make on this elevation turret is one half MOA. And, And a lot of folks will be like, well, then what am I supposed to do? Uh, this is not a problem. So I, I would tend to agree that it's better to be, um, like in golf, long than short. So I'm going to adjust one MOA up, and I'm going to be high on my point of aim, uh, or, or my point of impact, excuse me. And we can go back, and we're going to talk about zeros and zero distances mm-hmm. and how they correlate uh, downrange and what they can do for a shooter as a tool. And, and I'm going to know how high I'm going to be. Um, at my 100 yard zero, we'll look at a ballistics chart, uh, and I will tell you the yardage at which I'm zeroed, having zeroed from 100 yards, but actually mm-hmm. being further on. And so. that's the thing there too. Actually, you just mentioned because you talked about a ballistics chart. We haven't even opened a ballistics calculator yet. Nope. This is all just I'm, I don't even know how to explain it. This this doesn't have crazy scientific math. Nope. This is just zeroing the gun. This is just making the rifle scope and the rifle's barrel point in the same place at a certain distance. So um, we'll have you adjust those then. And uh, if all goes well, we should be dead on the money at the X. Now, one thing I will ask, and I I, want to make sure that I'm not interrupting the process too much, but these are all things that people might experience. Um, You adjust your turrets. And let's say you you were going to adjust them two and a half MOA. Mm -hmm. You adjust two and a half MOA. It doesn't move. Mm. You adjust again. It doesn't move. Mm-hmm. You just again, maybe then all of a sudden it jumps dramatically, yes. uh, or or you've adjusted and you've run out of adjustment and still hasn't moved enough. Yeah. What do you think is going on? Because that's something that that is I a, have seen a time or two. That is a brilliant question. Um, so, if everything is set up properly, and and by that I mean our our rifles action is tighten to the uh, stock properly, the base to the receiver, the rings to the base, and the um, scope in the rings. If everything is set up, what Jim just described should not occur. Um, But a very, very common call that we get here at at the shop is, 
folks are, as Jim said, adjusting, and the turret is seemingly unresponsive or is providing inappropriate adjustments. So if I dialed 2.5 MOA and got 0 MOA, or if I dialed 2.5 MOA and I got 5, um, what could that be? And the short answer is very, very, very often the case, ring over torque. Um, I would, I would argue that as somebody who, who works in the sales and technical department here at Vortex, it's our number one call um, for folks not being able to uh, maintain or hold a zero or get proper adjustments. Um, and ring torque is a pretty slippery topic. Uh, there's a lot of debate about what's too little, what's too much. Every ring manufacturer is different. A lot of our friends in the industry that, that make rifle scopes um, have different uh, opinions on it as well. I'll tell you from us here at Vortex, we recommend no more than 18 inch pounds on the rings. Um, certain ring styles have some, some caveats that go along with them. There's vertically split and horizontally split rings. The rings that we're using on this rifle are, are an example of a horizontally split ring, meaning there's a top and a bottom half rather than a left and a right. Um, vertically split rings are a little more um, particular about their torque pattern, but so long as you maintain that torque value and you don't exceed it, um, you should not be seeing that. Do not use Loctite on your ring screws. Loctite is a lubricant. Uh, lubricating the thread will misappropriate your torque if you're using a torque wrench by a considerable value. Um, we see it very often where folks are putting scopes on, they're, they're setting them up at 18 inch pounds, um, but they are Loctiting them and they call and, and they're seeing that. They remove the Loctite and the issue um, stops. And we've done a lot of testing on that. Yeah. And we've confirmed that at, like if you set it at 18 but you lubricate the threads with that Loctite, you've seen as high as like 24. Yep. Right? Yep. Which in the grand scheme of things, you think of that and you're like, yeah, the difference between 18 and 24 isn't that huge. You know, but, but really it, it can be and it can be enough because we're dealing with precision instruments mm -hmm. here. You know, and, and one person asked me a while back, they said, well, hey, I used to mount scopes all the time. Scopes tubes used to be made out of steel, and now they're made out of aluminum. Mm -hmm. It seems like that is actually an inferior uh, product or an inferior material to be using. Mm -hmm. And that was a very interesting question. I thought it was a very, it was a very good question to ask. But, you know, if, if maybe you're not as familiar with the newer, more modern scopes that are mostly all, pretty much at this point in time, all aluminum. And, you know, aluminum is a softer metal. And so you, you do, I guess, have more of a chance perhaps to do that, you know, that impingement to it or in, and kind yep. of impinge some of the internals. But the advantage is that look at how much more precise scopes yeah. are these days. Yeah. And, and the, the optical systems we're able to create with, with aluminum being a much more uh, easily machinable material and much more easily, easy to get more precise. And uh, the, the optical systems and just the... Just all the, the body of the scope mm -hmm. itself, the one-piece aluminum tubes nowadays, just things like that. These scopes are so much more precise that, you know, really, as long as you set it up right, it's going to be... It, they're still very reliable once Absol you set them up right. Absolutely. And that's I, the thing, too, is, is is just on the front end, if you do it right, these things will be correct, um, just fine. And I, I'd argue that a modern rifle scope um, made out of ultralight materials like aircraft-grade aluminum and and, um, you know, very uh, with, with thinner walled tubing than, than it, their predecessors are much stronger than older scopes. Um, lens elements do not shake loose. Erector systems do not break or bind under normal torque load and circumstance. So they are a stronger product than the older steel tube counterparts. Um, save for the tubing thickness, of course. So that's a little different. Well, like I said, we made a, we made a, our adjustments here for the, the windage and the elevation. Um, do we want to go ahead and, and check, uh, check a final here? Yeah, let's okay. do it. Cool. So I am anticipating this projectile is going to hit approximately one half minute of angle above, or thereabouts, above the X. Um, windage should be good, assuming I do my part. So stand by. Now, as predicted, a little high. There we go. I like it. I pulled the last shot. It should have landed just slightly right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got that confirmed now. Yeah. Now, what essentially, you know, at that point, then, one could say they're zeroed. I am zeroed. You are zeroed. Yeah. 
this this scope to this rifle is zero. Now, at that point, somebody could say they're done, right? So if you're yeah. just kind of deer hunting, let's say Midwest, that that might be all the adjusting your scope really even needs. Yep. And uh, from there, you could use if you had a BDC reticle, you can use the BDC. It helps to punch in maybe a little bit of information and do a ballistic calculator to really understand what those hash marks line up with. But a lot of people have been killing a lot of deers with BDC reticles set up on a rifle zeroed in at 100 yards. Absolutely. You know, if you are maybe a long-range shooter, a precision shooter, maybe even, a let's say, a western hunter that you are going to be down on your turrets a little bit more, this HSLR, for example, is a scope that's kind of designed for that application being a hybrid hunting, long-range shooting optic, uh, you know, there, from here, you might need to start do, doing a few more things, um, confirming at longer distances yep. and, uh, you know, doing a little bit more crunch work on ballistic calculators. But, Ryan, I know you mentioned a couple of things, like we we're going to talk again about the fact why we zeroed at 100 yards here, for example, um, some other cases where you might not zero at 100 yards, and then also what you might do with your ballistic calculator sure. after this. Um, so in this case, we'll use this rifle as a prime example. I, I'm forced to zero just slightly high at 100 yards. So I do not have an exacting zero at 100 yards. Um, and if we know the muzzle velocity on your, on your rifle firing a particular cartridge, now this is measured from this gun. Uh, if you know that value and you do have a, a simple ballistics calculator like the LRBC on our website, or we have a, you know, a multitude of them available for the... Um, uh, you know, the, the iPhones and the Androids and your, your mobile devices. Uh, you can plug those figures in uh, along with a couple of other kind of known figures about your, your round and your rifle, and you can come up with what your exacting distance is by simply tweaking the, um, the numbers and, and measuring, you know, your target and where your point of impact is downrange. Um, and that gets a little bit into the weeds, but a, a, a question... I get a lot, is what distance should I zero at? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's a very uh, subjective question, and I think it, it really comes down to the, the shooter's preference or the intended use or where we're hunting. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples um, that I personally use. When I hunt western states for antelope or mule deer, I often zero at exactly 200 yards. Um, and this, this affords me a couple of things. There's a, a term thrown around quite a bit called maximum point blank range. Uh, and there's some science behind calculating your maximum point blank range based on the, the critter you're chasing uh, or the target size that you're shooting. But with a, a very rudimentary understanding of ballistics, zeroing at 200 yards will allow me to have a, what I call a hide or hair hold at, uh, you know, 100, 200, probably out to 300, um, and still be absolutely within, uh, you know, ethical, vital shot on the game animal without having to, to make adjustments on my rifle scope or use uh, subtension holdovers to any degree of, like, seriousness, right? So it's a, it's a convenience thing. I zero at 200 because then I am able to basically put my reticle on that animal's vital area and ensure that I'm going to have an ethical hit at any one of those distances. Now, at 300, you'd probably likely hold maybe yeah. right at that back line. Um, yeah, it depends on the cartridge. Depends on yep. the cartridge. Depends on the cartridge, yeah. I'd say some common big game yeah. Probably not calibers. with the high wall. Yeah. You, probably not with the high wall. Right. With the high wall, you'd want to uh, aim just top of that mountain ridge. Behind. Yeah, right. But the high wall is a great question. So what distance do I zero with my high wall? And again, we've got to have a somewhat rudimentary um, understanding of the ballistics of that particular cartridge or, or rifle combination. And with my high wall, my 1885, it fires a big bullet relatively slow. Uh, it does not have a high BC. I do not think that the ballistic coefficient cracks 0.2 on that. So it's, uh, it's basically like shooting a soda can um, <laughs> or a shot glass or something like that. And so I zero that uh, at... It's dead on at 150 yards, but it has a redundant zero somewhere before that. But I zero it dead on at 150 yards. And at 200 yards, I'm about six inches low. That's about the farthest I'll shoot that gun, though. Yeah. So I've increased my maximum point blank range so that I'm not unusable at a close range because it's like six inches high at 50. Um, but I'm not terribly low at 200, six inches low at 200. So I know that if I'm holding within reason on the animal's vital area, I'm going to have an ethical hit. Um, and then certain 
certain syst- or certain cartridges or scenarios lend themselves useful to zeroing at an unknown distance like 50 yards. We were on a hunt uh, a couple days ago or last week or two weeks ago um, in Nebraska for whitetails. And we were using some higher performance muzzle loaders. And I, I was doing some theoretical number crunching on those. And I found that a 50-yard zero was far more advantageous than a 100-yard zero for us. We would actually increase our maximum point blank range uh, to a much more usable um, target distance so that we didn't have to rely heavily on the turrets or we didn't have to rely heavily on the reticles on this within, um, you know, ethical shooting distances. Uh, we were that, rolling 50-yard zeros? 50-yard zeros. I yeah. didn't even know. Yep, yep, 50-yard zeros. So what did, the, what did that make your kind of your maximum point blank? Uh, on the on one rifle that we used, the maximum point blank range that fifty yard zero was also like a hundred and twenty yard zero. Okay. And then on another rifle, that fifty yard zero was also a hundred and seventy five yard zero. Mm. Perfect. So for the two guns, the intended game, the terrain that we were hunting, it was pretty much we were going to use the reticle like the center crosshair to about the maximum distance that we would be comfortable taking a shot, unless we had ideal circumstances and we could dial the turrets or these kinds of things. Um, but I, I like to set myself up for the, the easiest, most, most ethical zero. Um, and there are certain situations, like if we're going to be shooting extreme long range competition, like we are shooting a mile or more where it's actually mechanically impossible to zero at a hundred yards due to a, a feature on your rifle. Let's say you're running a, an adjustable ring system, um, like an IV mount where you have, you know, up to dozens and dozens of additional MOA that you can turn into the mount, or you've got a... You, you, you have a, a canted mount. Mm-hmm. So essentially, for those not familiar with what a canted mount is, that's that's where the scope has a finite amount of adjustment within it. And if you have a zero MOA mount, that's like a flat rail that usually most guns will come with. And so you are limited to the amount of adjustment that your, your scope can input uh, or can have input into it in order to account for bullet drop is limited there as to you have zero MOA plus whatever is left over in the scope's range of travel. Uh, you know, let's say, let's say it'd be a, a scope with 80 MOA of adjustment total, and you zero at the perfect mechanical center. So you have 40 MOA of adjustment, of elevation adjustment to account for bullet drop out at long range. So that zero MOA base plus 40, that's, that's how much you have. Yep. Now let's say you can't 20 MOA into the base. So the base actually is slanted downward from rear to front downward. Now you have, if you zero and everything is all perfect, right, uh, 60 yep. MOA, essentially. Yep. And so you've, you've, you've cheated in some elevation into your rifle scope without ever having to touch a turret. Anyway, I just wanted to yeah. clarify that. And you can get to a point with 20 MOA or 30 or 40 or 60 or adjustable bases where you can, you can actually get to a spot where you cannot zero at 100 yards. You have to zero at two, three, four, five. Um, we've got some customers that do extreme long range shooting, 4,000 yards plus, and they will have to zero at 800 or 1,000 yards because of the amount of adjustment that's actually in their uh, their system. Um, and that's that's the, the starting point. That's kind of their starting line um, for adjustments there out for exactly the reasons that, that Jim had described. Um, so when you're doing, when you're setting your rifle up or when you're setting your system up for that, you know, keep in mind, zero distance should be something that, that's matched to the terrain, the anticipated style of shooting, and then the target itself. Can we talk real quick kind of about, we've been talking a lot about maybe long range or mm-hmm. hunting rifles. Let's talk about modern sporting rifles, a.k.a. the yeah. AR-15, yep. and similar platforms with uh, red dots, low power variable scopes, things things like that on there. Uh Rarely are you seeing, and, I, and this will also hopefully dovetail into the redundant zero that you mentioned, because some people might be wondering what the heck's going on. Why are we saying this gun is zeroed in at this distance, but also at another? Sure. So a lot of ARs get zeroed at 50. Yep. A lot get zeroed at 25, too. And then there's this also this 33-yard zero thing yep. going around. Um, rarely are they zeroed at 100. Yeah. And that has to do with the use, the primary use of the AR, which yep. tends to be... Uh, close quarters out to mid range, yep. and um, the fifty yard zero. Let's just say that because I know, for example, in the Strike Eagle one to eight and one to six, and the JM one BDC and the Razor one to six, those are BDC five five six reticles intended to be zeroed at fifty yards. The interesting thing about that is because the five five six, it's pretty flat shooting, mm-hmm. um, but the way that it the way that it shoots is if you're zeroed at fifty, 
you're also zeroed out essentially to 200 yards, Yep. basically. Yep. And that happens because sometimes when I explain this, I get lost in my own head as I'm explaining it. So tell me if I start to not make sense. But that happens because there is an optic overbore height. Our scopes are not inside of the barrel. And if they were, this probably wouldn't be the case. But our scope is mounted atop our rifle. And so if we were to, for example, zero our rifle at point blank at the end of the barrel, which you would never need to do, of course, you would have to have a tremendous angle uh, canted into the scope. Tremendous, because it has to point down exactly to the front of that barrel. Uh, but as you expand that distance out to, say, 50 yards, it still has kind of a downward angle. We're still kind of trying to have the barrel and the scope meet up somewhere. And so the, the barrel winds up pointing slightly upward, and the scope kind of winds up pointing slightly downward and making this triangle. Again, tell me if I'm No, you're 100% correct. And as the bullet then meets up with that point that we've zeroed the, ri the rifle at, at 50 yards, for example, it's still on its way up very slightly but it's still on its way up. So it's going to hit its peak just beyond that 50 yards. On an AR-15, it's somewhere around 100 to 105 yards, I believe, if you have a 50-yard zero, somewhere in there. And then it's going to start going on its way back down. And it will actually wind up meeting up with your reticle once again. So that's that redundant zero. And that's why we say, you know, an AR zeroed at 50 yards is essentially also zeroed at 200 yards. It will meet up again at 200 yards. And if you zero in closer, let's say 25 yards, you've, you've now um, over-dramatized, not over-dramatized, but you've, you've made that a more dramatic mm -hmm. angle. So it's coming up at a steeper angle to meet up at 25 yards. So it'll have a little bit more of an arc to it, and it'll wind up meeting up again out at eh, like 300-ish yards. Yep. Am I, did I explain no, that? No, right? 100%. One thing I do want to tell people, too, because this has been going around since I was a youngster reading gun mags, um, you hear the term flat shooting cartridge. You hear the term bullet rise um, and things like this. And to dispel any myths, bullets, if, if I was to take this rifle and remove its sighting device completely and I was to level it with the ground um, and we had a target downrange that it was pointed at and I fired the rifle, if it was fired at completely level, bore level to ground, uh, it, the bullet will never, the second it leaves, it leaves the muzzle, will never climb on its own. Yes. It will only fall. Gravity begins imparting drop on the bullet the moment that it leaves the muzzle of my rifle. And so no matter what you, you may have heard about bullets naturally coming out and, and lifting or, or having some sort of uh, loft upward, it, it's actually not true. That's a myth. Um, and, and to what Jim was saying, when you put the scope on there, you are, going to, you are going to add cant to your rifle. You're going to tilt your rifle, to your muzzle up at your target. In order to meet with where the scope Correct. is aiming. And, and so long as, as, like he said, you're forward of exactly in front of your muzzle or touching your muzzle, you will always introduce lift uh, into, into the, the barrel in order to hit your target downrange. Because rifles are just handheld cannons. Yeah. And you look at the cannons on an aircraft, you know, or not an aircraft carrier necessarily, but like a battleship or yes. something like that. They aim those suckers up pretty high. You I know, was you, hoping you were going to say pirate ship, but yeah, battleships too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you have to put you have to put arc yes. on something in order to get it a far distance. E exactly correct. And just so, like a basketball shooter, just like a football quarterback, uh, the guy that throws the um, first base home run uh, interceptions. What is it? Interception is baseball, right? No, I think that's um, hockey. Oh, okay. Badminton? Volleyball. Touche. All right. I'm lost. <laughs> it's sports, Mark. It's Who knows? Yeah. Everybody should You guys out. obviously know a lot more about that <laughs> stuff than I do. People should be shooting and hunting instead. Yeah. No, but I mean, I think, we're, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking about a couple things here. We're talking about angles, mm -hmm. right? Yep. We're always talking about angles or oftentimes with this process or, or, or what's happening, but also... You're firing that bullet at a specific angle, but then the path of that bullet, because of gravity, like it doesn't just keep going at that angle no. on that vector, Correct. so that bullet is going to have that ballistics curve, so that's where you get that, where it's kind of crossing yes. two points yep. at yeah. different distances. Yep. Precisely. Yep. Imagine your scope projecting a laser beam straight out, but your bullet's going to go up 
and then come back down through it. Yeah. Yep. Or even, like you said, throwing a football. Yeah. At, at two points in time, that football is going to be at the same height. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. Very good point. So, what do you think? I'd say at this point, this rifle is zeroed in. And, uh, you know, we've gone into our long range 1001. We've talked a little bit about it here. We have a lot of other podcasts relating to uh, things you can do with a zeroed in rifle. And, uh, but that's kind of the process. We thought we'd do it a little semi live, maybe uh, talk about a couple of things that we get questions on quite frequently. But, you know, otherwise at this point, now comes the fun part. Now you just go shoot. Yep. Anything else, guys? Any last calls on this one? Um, know your gun, know your load, uh, know your scope. And if you've got questions on it, uh, we do a lot of shooting at Vortex with a lot of different stuff. Um, there's a good chance that, that we've, we've come you know, pretty close to a, an experience uh, that you might be seeing. So if, if you're stuck on something or if you've got a question on something, don't hesitate to reach out to us. That's what we love to chat about, um, whether it's ballistics or different rifles or rings. Um, that, that w- we enjoy that quite a bit. So. Yeah, mine, uh, you asked me for last call, Jim, and you touched on it earlier. If you can do these things properly or correctly on the front end, including, you know, the mounting of your rifle scope and, and all the stuff that goes into that and, and expediting the site or, or just the site end process, um, you're gonna, just going to save yourself time, frustration, ammo, money that goes into ammo. Totally. Mine is shooting guns. This is fun. Bam. Yeah. That's all I got. All right. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. We'll uh, have some video along with this and uh, talk about it funny on Instagram and things like that. Let us know if you have any other ideas as far as semi-live stuff goes, too, that you want to hear. This is pretty fun. I mean, yeah. we got to podcast and shoot guns. So uh, hopefully it helps you guys out. Thanks for listening and potentially Slash watching. watching, maybe. Yeah. All right. Bye. 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 All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.